Take your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 10, and then Numbers chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 10, Numbers chapter 13. This may be the last message I preach in this series. Um, I won't lie to you, when I started putting this together, I took the notes that I had put together. Brother Reg Kelly wanted me to come down and uh, a few couple years ago and preach on uh, the giants. And um, so he had me down for, a, I think, a Sunday morning, Sunday night type deal. I don't, I don't remember if we were there a couple more days after that through Wednesday. No, I don't remember. But the first message, uh, the, actually the second one that I, he had me teach on it during Sunday school. And then during the Sunday morning service, I actually wrote a, a preaching message, an evangelism type message. I don't know if you are aware, there are different things that I do throughout the week. Um, this morning, Sunday, usually the Sunday morning service is an evangelistic type preaching service. I, uh, I get loud. I try to bring conviction to both saints and sinners to either come to the Lord or come back to the Lord. That's what I do Sunday morning. Sunday school, we usually go through a, a place in the scripture. Wednesday night is a Bible study, prayer time. The Watchman broadcast, I'm usually dealing with uh, a, a major subject that deals with Bible prophecy. And Pastor Mike online, I'm just me goofing off with a Bible in my hand. And uh, who knows what I'm liable to come up with. Uh, who said amen? Kick you out. But I preached this message in Brother Reg's church. Went to Brother Reg's house for lunch that afternoon. Reg told me, and you have to know how I f my feelings about Reg. I love him to death. God used that man to literally change my life and my whole attitude about pastoring. God literally used him to, to set me free of being afraid of the faces of men when I preach. And Red said to me, Mike, that, was, that is without a doubt the best preaching sermon I've ever heard you preach in my life. Now, I cannot guarantee you, I'm going to use the same notes, cannot guarantee you that I'm going to give you the best sermon you've ever heard me preach in your life this morning, but I am going to confront you with some giants. And I'm hopefully going to teach you how to not run. How to not be afraid. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all did eat of the same spiritual meat, and all did drink of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. God is telling us that what you see in the Old Testament, they were no better off nor worse off than you and I are today. No difference between either of them. But with many of them, verse 5, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples. To the intent, we should not lust. You, you need to read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I encourage you to read those books of the Bible. And what you don't understand one day... Go back a year later, read them again. You'll understand something different the next year. I guarantee you, you will. That's how we grow in grace and knowledge. 
But he said, with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. He's talking about the deal at Mount Sinai, which I'm not, I don't know if I've preached on that yet. But anyway, he said, neither let us commit fornication. I preached on that last Sunday. As some of our, uh, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and 20,000, 23,000 people died of a plague in one day. And you're scared of COVID? When God sends a plague to kill people, people die. It is a judgment of God. Neither be uh, idolaters. Verse 8, neither let us commit fornication. Verse 9, neither, uh, neither let us tempt Christ. This is where we're going. No, I already did that. Neither let us tempt Christ. So some of them also tempted him were destroyed as serpents. We already did that one. Neither murmur you, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they were all written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. So up on the screen, what I did was, I just put up, in case you haven't been following along, here is where we used to be. If you are born again, um, if you are saved, if your hope and your glory is in the Lord Jesus Christ, Albert, this is where you were at one time in your life, and God brought you out. Now, are you here yet? No. Are you trying to get there? Yes. Which is why he is going to follow the Lord in the Lord's baptism. But he understands that getting wet with water does not improve his chances of going from here to there. What it does, it shows everybody in the world... I'm going from here to there. And I'm not going to let any of this stop me. Now, in my life, I've had encounters, as I've, I've tried to be open and honest. I've had encounters with this stuff. Mount Sinai, waters of Meribah, gainsaying of Korah, the rebellion of Korah, the brazen serpent. Now we're going to deal with the issue of the ten spies. So I want you to take your Bible. Uh, before, we, yeah, before we go to Numbers, let me read these verses. Joshua chapter 10, verse 24, And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war, which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. I believe those kings were giants. And this is what we're going to deal with this morning. Because in Numbers 13, you remember they sent 12 spies into Canaan land to spy out the land to see if it was as good as God said it was. When they came back, they said, Yep, not only is it as good as God said it was, here's the fruit from the land. You remember they had a one grape uh, stalk hanging on a rod with two men carrying in. Those grapes must have been that big around. Full of juice. They said, a land flowing with milk and honey. That's an understatement. It is gushing with goodness. It's, it, it's more than what God said it was. And so... 
All they had to do is go in and kill the giants, and, they, and that's what halted them. Now, we're skipping ahead a little bit. In Joshua, Joshua said, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. Brother Sterling fought, a de uh, fought a, an enemy called death and asked God to help him. God gave him the victory. When they brought him home from the hospital, he had two great big machines like this. One, one of them this big, the other one this big, same size, two of them pushing massive doses of oxygen into his lungs to keep him alive. Look at him now. Well, I'll just say he's cheating. He's supposed to have an oxygen bag on, but he won't do it. He decided, I don't need that air. Real men don't. That's right, amen. Real men don't need air. <laughs> amen. But that man could have gone to heaven. I believe while we prayed, we prayed. I believe if he would have said, God, just get me on out of here. But I told him, I said, Sterling, you know, you may feel like you're done with this life, but your family doesn't think so. And your church doesn't think so. We need you. And so God spared him. He didn't run from the giant. He faced him down and slew him. Now you, you get a hold of this. I'm not trying to uplift one man in our church. I don't do that. But if I'm going to use an example, I'm going to use, I'm going to use him. And if I can think of another out example out of this church, I'll use you. I'll use Pam. Can I use Pam? I guess. Pam's made mistakes before in her life and decided one day, I'm not running away from these things ever again. I'm going to stand up to them and I'm going to fight them. Her and Brian both. And they both fought them, and they both won. Be strong and of good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. Now, I'd just like to point out something. Here's an here's a x-ray of your foot. Even, you have 26 bones in your foot, but in those bones there are 33 joints. Now, who is it that was 33 in the Bible? Jesus. I think that's neat, don't you? But when you have one foot, you got 33 joints. When you have two feet, how many do you have? Now, let's go back here to Joshua. When he said, come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. There's a number that he's giving them. It's the number 66. How many books are there in the Bible, Ed? 66. What is it that can defeat all of your enemies against whom you fight? The Word of God. And, the, and he, he said, but look what he said. Be strong and of good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. The Lord will do it. Turn your Bibles to... Um, Turn your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. I'll show you this in the Bible. This will make you so happy you will forget how hungry you are. 
which I'm asking you, please forget how hungry you are. Look at your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Bible says, verse 24, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his what? Sixty six books in your Bible. His feet are dominion over your enemies. Verse 26, look at that, Brother Sterling. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is... Woo! Death! Because, you see, when Bonnie died, she cured her cancer. When Bonnie died, she cured herself of all of her pain, all of the misery, all of the woe, all of the... They couldn't even touch her because it hurt her so bad. And Roy would just sit there and go, I can't take this. The Lord defeated the last enemy she'll ever face, ever. Where he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So Joshua, watch, look at what happened. Joshua, and afterward they said, smote, Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. What does that look like to you when you hang somebody on a tree? It's the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that, but now turn to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. Now, one thing I am going to do with this is I'm going to hopefully completely rid out of your mind the idea that you are ever going to make it to heaven by one good work. I am so sick of internet Christianity that is promoting a works salvation. That is promoting if you go if you go to church on Saturday, you're saved. If you if you confess to the priest, then you're saved until you sin again, then you must confess to the priest again. That is a work salvation. I am sick of it. I'm going to fight against a works-based gospel until my last breath is drawn and gone out of me. I hate it. It makes me angry to hear somebody tell somebody else, you must do this and you must do it right 100% of the time or you will never go to heaven. This lady I was talking about, Gwen Shamblin, the lady who got filthy rich off of writing books telling everybody that if you loved God, you'd lose weight. God destroyed her in a plane crash because she had turned, she had turned her little ideas on, on dietary methods on how to lose weight into the gospel she was saying she actually said go ahead and eat that extra bite if you love satan go ahead and and deny yourself of that extra bite to show god how much you love him he will reward you with eternal life if you will slim down. In other words, fat people don't stand a chance going to heaven. And you know what? I'm not sorry she's gone off this earth. 
Because her and her gospel, they deserve to be in hell. Now, Numbers chapter 13, verse 27. They told him and said, we come. This is God spent, God, God sent 12 spies. How many? 12. Now, I want you to notice they were divided. 10 against 2. They told him and they said, We came into this land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses. And, say, and you, you know what they were saying? There's giants everywhere. By saying the Canaanites, he was saying, There's gi they're giants. By saying the children of Anak, he's saying they're all giants. Um, boy, I wish I would have put this in my message. Doggone it, why didn't I do that? Somebody sent me, I think it was Joshua Haynes, sent me an old caricature drawing on an old stone building or something like that from a couple thousand years ago of a giant carrying two elephants under each arm. Now, you know what? I believe that. I believe those giants were that big because they all said we stand as grasshoppers in their sight and when they see us they see us as grasshoppers in their sight. That's how big those giants were. Now do you think giants like that could pick up and two elephants and tuck them under each arm? And verse 30, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we, all be able, we, well, we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we, are not, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of, of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The Lord... Uh, the land through which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature, and, we, and there we saw of the giants, the sons of Enoch, which came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And he's telling you how they were. They're that big. And I believe it. And I believe God made them that big for a reason. To make them so large and so big so that you would say one of two things. I'm either going to run out of here as fast as I can and never come back. Or I'm going to make my stand against this giant and God's going to kill him right at my feet. And we have that kind of faith available to each and every one of us. By the way, ten. There was ten of them saying... We cannot go in. What does ten represent? The law. Ten commandments. You will never, ever, if you ever put it in your mind that one of these days you're going to be righteous enough to enter into heaven without Jesus Christ. You're wrong, and you're an idiot for thinking that way. 
You're never going to be that good. I nailed Bradley Crumb's hide to the wall one day on the phone. You remember Bradley, right? Mormon. Bradley, I'm reading, I'm reading right out of the Mormon Pearl of, uh, Pearl of Great Price. I had a copy of it. I said, Bradley, it says right here that, uh, that the Mormons are saved by grace after all they have after all they can do and that they must obey the commandments of God is that what you believe he said yep and I said Bradley do you have on your underwear and he knew I said your Mormon underwear do you have on your Mormon underwear? Well, no. I said, if you were to die today, according to your doctrine, where will you go? To hell. And then I asked him, I said, Bradley, let me, let me ask you a question. Are, are you perfectly righteous yet? And he said, no. I said, please tell me, what day do you expect to be perfectly righteous? He got quiet. And you know, he never did to this day, he never did give me a day where he was going to be perfectly righteous before God. And finally, one day, God broke him. God broke him. And he's pastoring a church out in Oklahoma right now. Good church, by the way. But there was two of them that said, yes, we can. Two witnesses. Out of the mouth of two witnesses, let every word be established. Joshua and Caleb. And they, by the way, they were the only two who went into the promised land. They said, of course we can go in there. God said we could. God said he'd kill them all before we even got there. What are you afraid of? Now, the reason why God made these giants so big is that they represent things that are stronger than us. Practically everybody in this building would be able to understand what I have up here. They are stronger than us. Lust of the flesh. An adulterer cannot stop his own adultery. He cannot stop. He's facing a 40-foot giant who has two elephants under his both arms and the giant's just laughing at him, saying, you think you're going to beat me? Fornication. Men or women breaking marriage vows. Alcohol. Drugs. Etc. And I can tell you, they are giants that your flesh just can't break but who can who can who can destroy them for you Jesus can lust of the flesh lust of the eyes coveting your neighbor's wife or husband looking at pornography And I had this down in my notes, child lust, lusting after young girls or boys at church, homosexual lust. Let me tell you something. I think it's possible. Now, I don't know this for a fact, and I don't know it about this church. But I think it's possible that in just about every church, I don't, and I won't, I won't stop at just America. In every church in the world, 
there's at least one person there who lusts after children. There was a pastor who worked with one of our ministries, I won't say which one, out in Kenya, that was arrested for molesting children. Worked, in our, worked for one of our ministries out there. It's a lust of the eyes. It's a giant that you cannot destroy. Only God can. Pride of life. Pride of life. The pride of life is the guy in the church who says, well, thank God I'm not like those other people. I don't have their sins. In fact, I don't have any sins. Or, my race is superior to theirs anyway. I'm a fundamentalist. I cannot fall. I have a King James Bible. I cannot fall. Those are giants. That will destroy you in a heartbeat because they are things that, they, that you think you can do it on your own. And you're going to lose. Somebody say amen. Romans 8. For what the law could not do. Remember how many spies was telling them they couldn't go in? Ten. Tends the law. For, for Gary, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Remember what Joshua said? Thus saith the Lord, this is what God is going to do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. Remember in the days of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, when he found out that the three armies were going to come down against him, and he went to God and he said, God, there's no way that our armies can fight off these three massive armies. They're going to kill us all. God, what, what, what can we do? And God told him, don't do nothing. Don't do nothing. Just go step up, up on that mountain up there, out of my way and you sing amazing grace how sweet the sound and then I'll do all the enemy killing for you and the Bible says that, that by the time they were done there wasn't one of them left alive he killed every one of them somebody say amen And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flowing with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Now, God put into you something. Who knows about fight or flight syndrome? You know what that is? It's, a, it's an immediate reaction to something that when you are immediately with fear, you either, it either just, it just injects every muscle in your body with adrenaline to either run. Sterling's got four jokes that he tells, and one of them is these two little boys was getting beat up, and a guy was chasing after them, and one boy got beat up, and the other boy got away, and the, other, the boy that got beat up finally got to the boy that ran away, and he said, man, how come I got beat up and you didn't? He said, because you ran as fast as you could. I ran as fast as I had to. That's one of his jokes. It'll either cause you to run 
or calls you to stand and fight. Now let me tell you something. God didn't put it in us to run. He put it in us to stand and say, let's go. I'm not backing down. I'm not moving. This is my church. This is my family. This is my soul. I'm not losing it for nothing. Nothing. I got done with that quicker than I thought. John, won't you take him downstairs? I want everybody to bow your head. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Looking down at the floor, close your eyes. Let me say it, let me say it to you like this, because I know this church. There are people in this church who have faced heavy, heavy drug addictions. that decided I'm not going to run I'm going to stand and God blessed them and they're still standing and yeah so what so so what so what if the giant pushes you down get back up There are people in this church that have faced alcohol addiction. And they wanted to run. But God put something in them and now they just want to stand. And say, I'm not running no more. Even if, even if I lose it. Even if I get pushed and fall down, I'm going to get back up. There are people in this church who have porn addictions. They decided they're not going to run. They're going to stand and fight. Again, I don't know. I, I'm telling you, I'm being honest. I don't know. There may even be somebody in this church who has a child addiction. God forbid it. Fight it. Don't run. Stand up and fight it. Some people in this church face death. And they decided not to run. They decided to stand. I've had that same, same choice, that same decision. I made that same same choice one day. And I said, God, I don't want to leave here yet. Now, one of the worst things that anybody in this church could have is a giant of pride. That you're not like everybody else. God made you superior. You have better doctrine than everybody. You carry a King James Bible. You were raised in a fundamental church. You, you believe in once prayed, always saved. So therefore, you cannot lose 
nothing, so you can just do whatever you want to, you little runner. All you are is a runner. That's all you are. Giants are beating you up every day. And you just run from them. And hide behind a fake doctrine. This morning, I want, you to ask, I want you to ask the Lord who you are, what giant you face, and ask the Lord this morning, God, put it in me to stand. Put it in me to stand, not run. Joshua and Caleb are in heaven to this day and nobody, nobody that they left Egypt with are there. Nobody. They all died and perished in the wilderness. And I believe they died and went to hell. Every one of them. Because they ran or wanted to run. And Joshua and Caleb said, I don't care how big they are. I don't care how many elephants they can eat at once. I'm not running from them. I have God with me. My God is bigger than all the giants standing on their shoulders, stacked on top of each other. My God is bigger than all of them. So whatever your giant is, don't run. Stand. It makes them mad. Oh, it makes them mad. You stand against them. Kyle Rittenhouse, I don't know if, he, if he's saved or not. But they tried to bust him up with bogus charges. He stood and won. You stand. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you today. Lord, I'm thanking you, God, for being a good God. Thanking you, God, for in the days, Father, when I wanted to run, you put it in me to stand. I was scared to death. I was scared to death. But you put it in me to stand and not run. God, with each one of these who've heard this message this morning, God, put it in them to stand. And if they get knocked down, stand again. And just like Sister Pam said, if she makes a mistake, you forgive her again. If she makes it again, you forgive her again. Your mercy lasts forever. That's what you said. So God, give us the grace to always stand against our giants and never, ever run. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.